Welcome to Rome. This is The Bittersweet Life with Katie Sewell and Tiffany Parks. Hello, this is The Bittersweet Life. I'm Katie Sewell. Tiffany is away this week, but I am joined by Viola Buitoni. She's an Italian-born, California-based cooking instructor and food writer, and her new book is titled Italy by Ingredient, Artisanal Foods, Modern Recipes. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much, Kati. And in 2020, according to your bio, the president of the Italian Republic honored you with a very special title. What is that title? The title is Cavaliere dell'Ordine della Stella, which is kind of like the first level of the knighthood, as I like to call it, is a starter knighthood. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and uh, it is something that's given to people who are recognized for the work they do to further the culture and business of, of Italy. In my case, it's, it's about my work in food for many, many years. And what did it mean to you? Anything to get that title? Yes, actually it did. You know, I thought I was that I was um, immune to these things. I felt like I was a little jaded. I'm like, oh, whatever, it's just another title. But I have to say that when our local consul here in San Francisco uh, stepped up and said all these very beautiful things about me and explained why he thought I was the right person for it, I got I got a little teary eyed. So I started eating because that's what I do when I'm <laughs> emotional. And there's, in fact, a, a photo of me and the consul standing next to one another where he's handing me the, he's handing me the certificate and the, and the little pins that go with this. And I, my cheeks are like blown out for like from chewing some focaccia. So it's very telling of why I got it. <laughs> a passion, yes. Yes. Well, I thought it would be fun as a lens uh, to get us started to have you explain how your family has affected food for many generations. Yeah. Six generations, I believe you Six cite in the book. Yeah. yeah, I mean, in two ways, I would say. One of them is that my family is one of the families that made the, the history of pasta in Italy. Uh, my last name can be seen in, in a lot of like foods and various pasta and sauce things, both in Italy, but also in the United States. Also, my family later on, about uh, two generations into into their pasta adventure, also started dealing with chocolates. Um, so Perugina chocolate, which is known for the bacio, which is the silver foil with the blue star chocolate, was also underwritten by my family in and um, and developed by a woman named Luisa Spagnoli, who had a lot of craft but not a lot of money. So I, we've been my family has been associated with these two brands for. Six generation, as I said, so that's a lot of years. We did sell everything, so everything belongs by ne to Nestle's by now, but the last name is still the same. And I was part of the entrepreneurial history up until my 20th year of age, so I remember it quite well. Wow. And uh, the other way in which it affected me, it's because my parents, uh, who were rather exacting about the quality of food that they ate, um, like to make sure that they got the best food that they could get and the best food that they could get was the one that they could grow on their land by themselves so i grew up in a in an old in an old house it was actually a convent from the 15th century the the uh, the base structure that has much land around it and so we had olive grove from which olive oil was pressed we had chickens we had like a big vegetable plot my mother loved flour so we even had like a some of the plot was dedicated to flour so even the flowers that were in the vases actually came from our land wow amazing so, yeah. so with all that rich, rich history do you have um a distinctive memory of your first childhood introduction to food do you have a I don't know, a vision that comes it's in. It's funny, being... right? Yeah. You know, people ask me all the time. And the truth is, I don't really have any um, conscious memory without really delicious food in my life. <laughs> I mean, the things that I think about, the smells that come to me that once in a while, like I encounter and all of a sudden I'm back in that world are um, the smell of cheese cooking, the way that like casin smells when it's affected by heat is, is very strong for me. Molds, the molds that make salumi are also really affect me. In fact, just last month I was in Italy at a wedding in a beautiful old home outside of Cremona. The, the chef who took me down to the cavo where he ages his cheeses and his salumi and like I stepped in and all of a sudden I was like, this, you know, this like four or five years old that ran around <laughs> among the, the prosciutti and the sausages that hung in some of the, the, the rooms in my house growing up. 
those are the things that I remember. Mm -hmm. You know, I, there are, I think the first time, yes, I do remember one of the first times, I think I was about five, that I tried this particular pizza that they make in Orbetello on the southern coast, uh, Tuscan coast of Italy, which has onions and uh, anchovies inside, which was amazing. Mm -hmm. And it's something like whenever I'm in Italy, every time I make sure that I go there and have that pizza. One of the things that you describe in the book is living with a clock that's made of food. Yeah. What do you mean by that? What I mean is that because we because we had all this space, right, there was the house was big and then there was a whole part of the house that were just like old. There was even like old warehouses and old storage areas. There was even like a out of use um, olive mill, like old stone olive mill in it. Uh, my parents liked to really like gather people and entertain around food. And so food, as you know, has like seasons and times, right? And those are not just because of the products that are born at the time, but also because of the different uh, occasions that you're commemorating. So it could be a holiday um, or it could be like somebody's birthday, you know, like an anniversary of some kind. So there were some things that always I knew would happen at certain times of the year. So um, an example that I love is uh, my mother was a fantastic jam maker. And so when the time came, which was generally the end of summer, we'd go and we'd pick blackberries. So what that meant to me, in addition to the fact that I would be getting some delicious jam, was also the sad fact that I very, very soon would be going back to school because it was the end of the summer. Mm -hmm. um, and then when we made the cheese bread, that was for Easter. And then in January, there was the pig slaughtering. And so that there was all this celebration and this gathering of people around the uh, these different food occasions that told me where I was in in the clock of life, in the clock of the year. Hmm, fascinating. So, I mean, to a lot of Americans listening to this, what your childhood sounds like sounds ideal, but I know that you also at 19 decide to move abroad and move to the United States. Why in the world did you do such a thing when you lived in such so, a beautiful first, place? <laughs> <laughs> I did live in a beautiful place, right? So there's... Yeah. Um, you know, there are several reasons. The first one is that there was this wonderful, like, home life. But um, I grew up in a town that is a beautiful town, but it's not particularly open to the outside. And I was always very open to the outside. I was always very curious. And Perugia is, is a beautiful, but fa fairly small town where I didn't find, especially um, as as a scion of, like, such a such a notable family that I would really be able to become who I wanted to be or, or who I knew I could be freely in a way that just allowed me to be myself. Um, also, because I think that, you know, at 19, you know, you're 19, you get to New York and it's amazing, right? I mean, I think any 19, 19 year old gets to New York and it's like, it's the energy and it's beautiful. And I got to New York because my dad lived there at the time because he was he was working for it started working in the early 80s for the company it was still the families and so he said hey why don't you come and check out new york and let's see let's see if you like it and i mean you know how can you not like new york so i moved away also because my parents my delightful parents marriage at some point crumbled when i was in my early teen years and so that really very much changed the way that we lived and the significance that all these beautiful things had became more fraught. You know, it wasn't all happiness anymore. It was also tension and it was also difficulty. And it was also, you know, uh, my parents using the five of us, because I have four siblings, as a little bit of a, of a tug of war. So um, all these things I just wanted to get away with from. Mm -hmm. you know, life is not, as you know, the way that we we see other people's life from the outside doesn't always tell the whole story, right? Yes, that's so true. Yeah. But, yeah. but so I know that that growing food and, and food is a passion of your families. But was it always for you? Like when you do get to the, the US, do you think I want to work with food? Was that always the goal? No, I get to the US to go to school. That's why I got to the US. And I got to the US. And then initially, um, I was a little you know, I realized how important food was to me, right? And initially I was a little um, stumped at where I could go to get the deliciousness to which I was used. And I would say that I found a lot of very good things. I mean, for example, I am a diehard fan of New York Jewish delis. One of the first restaurants where I went to uh, was uh, a now defunct place called Katz's Deli. And I had pastrami for the first time. And I 
knew that I could find good food in this country. I just had to look for it a little bit. Mm-hmm. So it became more of a focus for me, right? That the food that I had that I had eaten, like the great food had always been there. I never really had to think about it. Uh, now I had to start thinking about it. So I did go to school. Um, and but while I was going, I was cooking and I was developing this this passion for like finding the food and not just Italian food, but also like the good food that's produced locally, because, you know, in the States, it's great local food. Like people don't realize that, you know, they think outside of the States, people think of, of here just as a land of fast food. But there actually are, as you know, many local reality that produce fantastic artisanal things and great produce. So I, it became, as I said, a very important pastime, much more of a thing than it had been when I lived in Italy. And then after school, a friend of mine said, oh, you know, you love cooking so much and you're not sure about what to do uh, now that you're finished school. So why don't you just work in a restaurant? A friend of mine is opening a restaurant and then you'll figure out what to do. So it turned out that I did figure out what to do it was I wanted to be in food. So mm-hmm. that, that was it. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, in addition to the recipes in this book, you do provide like, some some of your thoughts and some resources on how to find like high quality food. And, and maybe it's impossible to give out like a couple tips to people listening. But do you have any like little suggestions you can make about how does someone go about finding something that's high quality in wherever they are? Well, I mean, in the age of Internet, it's fairly easy. Right? So you, you type whatever you want, but it is also true that you type what you want and then you are assaulted by a million things. And there are things that you can look at. I mean, um, when we talk about Italian food, the Italian authorities are pretty exacting in terms of making sure that the food is what it says it is or what it purports to be. And so those are the brands that you look for. So you look for the seal of like organic or you look for a seal that um, of European branding of quality, like the PDO brand, which means protected denomination of origin or the PGI, which is protected geographical indication. Uh, So those are the things to look for. You also look for provenance, right? So if you want to do some San Marzano and you see that the San Marzano are grown in uh, in Piedmont, they're probably not very good San Marzano, right? Mm. So that's what you want to look for. Where does it come from? And does it make sense in terms of what you're trying to make? So I always tell people to do that. And also think of the age. Let's take olive oil, very important, right? Olive oil uh, should be used within 12 to 18 months of being produced. Mm -hmm. So um, producers in Italy are now now required to put in the uh, date of production as well as the, the best buy date. So look for that. Uh, A producer who will put that they will tell you that they're serious about their their crop. Okay. So in your book, Italy by Ingredient, you say that you aim to guide the cook through, and this is a quote, through the physical sensations that say you are on the right track. What do you mean by that? Katie, I am so happy that you found that because all the events that I've done, that is the paragraph that I have been reading and you found it by yourself. So I have been teaching for uh, 13, 14 years by now, because that's been kind of like the, uh, th- what I do now is, is teaching, right? I should, have, I should have said that. What I do now is teaching, and I teach people how to cook at home. So I have developed a method of teaching through the years that tells me that the best way to teach people how to cook is by talking to them about what happens in the relationship between themselves and the food as the food changes with heat with dressing because you know the senses are the things we all have and so I like my students to think of the senses as a tool like another tool that they need to sharpen you keep your knife sharp you keep your senses sharp and what I mean for example let's say that you want to cook a tomato and you want to make a tomato sauce that is fresh now this tomato may be a different kind of tomato right there are many Uh, It may be super ripe or it may be kind of like greener. It may be a type of tomato that is very, that has a lot of seeds, but it's very sweet. Or it could be one that has no seeds, but it's super tart. So I cannot tell you cook this tomato for five minutes because I would have to tell you exactly the age of the tomato, what kind of tomato. And, you know, you can't, you can't really do that. And so I tell people to instead look uh, for the changes, like the noise changes, the smell changes, the textural changes, the color changes. Especially, I think that uh, 
listening and smelling are two very important things. Food makes different noise depending on, on what stage of its cooking it's in. And so that's what I mean by telling people to step up to the stove with senses lit, to just really be kind of physically engaged uh, with that, with that part of cooking. And I actually think that that's part of what makes this cookbook so delightful to read. And I actually <laughs> marked, I actually marked an example, two examples, uh, if you don't mind me reading for you. No, not at all. Uh, here's an example. Uh, since you were just talking about sound, you say, the vegetables will gradually release their moisture and fragrance. They will emit a slow and full sizzle. As the moisture cooks off, the sizzle will get tighter and crinkly. Keep your ears pricked. If the sizzle becomes a screech, the vegetables are calling for help. Add two to three tablespoons of warm water so they do not stick and burn and continue yes. cooking. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> a great description. Or another one, when you say to add wine to meat, you say, stand by the stove. And when the scent of the wine no longer punches your face and instead caresses your nose sweetly, stir in the stock tomato mixture. Yes. <laughs> you caught it. Yes. It's yes. both That's helpful those... and entertaining to read. Thank you. <laughs> it really is. Okay. So the title is Italy by Ingredient. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously you can't dissect all of Italy's ingredients. So how did no. you go about choosing which ingredients to center the book around? Um, well, so I wanted to do a mix of ingredients that are readily available and some that kind of would push the the cook and the reader outside of their comfort zone and make them look for more. So if you take, for example, parmigiano or, you know, balsamic vinegar, capers, olives, those are pretty easy to find. But then there's bottarga, which is the um, salt cured, pressed and air dried uh, roast sack of a mullet or a tuna, um, which is available, but you actually have to want to find it. You have to want to explore your inner cook. You're in an Italian cook, but in general, you're in a cook. So I wanted to have a mix of that. I also kind of like went through all my recipes and look at the at the words that are there the most in terms of ingredients. You know, that took a while because I have like you know, mm -hmm. a thousand recipes by now. Um, yeah. and, then, and then I also just kind of lay down on the floor of my pantry and looked up and I looked at what was there. I eliminated pasta, which takes up three shelves because in my opinion, pasta needs a book and not a chapter. Mm. And once I've taken that out, it's like, okay, what is it that I have there? What is it also not? It's not about how much space it, it takes up, but how often do I reach for it? Mm, I like that. Yeah, I was going to ask you why pasta got eliminated, because I think that would be people's go-to thought. If it's in Italy, it's got right? a Yeah, everybody's pasta. like, oh, you've got pasta and you've got olive oil. I'm like, yes, I do, meaning they are throughout the book, but there's not going to be a, a chapter just on pasta because, you know, it just seems um, um, diminutive. Too much. What pasta is reductive, yeah. And, but there, there are every chapter as like at least one and often more uh, pasta recipes. Yes. So, okay. So one of the things you do at the beginning of each section is you kind of give like a history background um, about the ingredient or ingredients in some cases, because you do have chapters that are like olives and capers, you know, or a chapter on tomatoes. But you give kind of a background history of, of this ingredient itself. And obviously we can't talk about all of them, but is there one that you'd want to tell us a little bit about the history or background of your choice? Your yes, I think what I like to tell uh, people the most about is, is uh, balsamic vinegar because it is one of the uh, most ubiqu ubiquitous, ubiquitous and yet more misunderstood ingredients, right? Mm -hmm. We all have it, we all have it, love it but most of us know absolutely nothing about it. <laughs> um, so my um, my aim with this book is to dis disambiguate some of the ingredients like aceto balsamico. So aceto balsamico uh, is born, is, you know, it's been around for like about a thousand years. The, the area of production, which is the modern Reggio Emilia in uh, um, kind of like Eastern Emilia Romagna, um, have been producing vinegars that were famous for their quality. I think it's in the 18th century that we first, yes, in 17 something, that we first see the word balsamic referred to vinegar. And it referred as, um, it referred to like a, a small production, like kind of the top small production of the duchy palace at that time. 
with time, this became something that was coveted by, you know, noble family courtiers would want to get it to ingratiate themselves with uh, kings and queens all over the world. Um, and then eventually, uh, after Italy experienced an economic boom and the secrets started getting out of what, what have been the ethics of the families of the area. What happened is that this happens and all of a sudden there's someone who says, oh, look, I could make some money here, right? Mm -hmm. I could just make something that is similar, that has a similar uh, profile. People don't know the difference anyway because they've never tried the real thing. So um, there comes the situation where all of a sudden balsamic vinegar is everywhere, which, you know, already in, its, in itself is suspicious because this is this is a an ingredient that really cannot even be given the name until it's been aged for 12 years, mm -hmm. right? So there really isn't that much balsamic vinegar. So at some point, the people were making the balsamic vinegar, raised their hands and said, hold on a second. We've been making this well. We've been making this right. It's essential to our livelihood. So let's defend ourselves. So that's when everything started making more sense and it was constructed in a way that now we can look at it and we know uh, what we're buying and you know people should feel free to keep buying crap pardon my language mm -hmm. as long as they know that it's crap and if they do that's fine so let's talk of the word so it's aceto balsamico right and the two words in themselves mean nothing unless we attach to them the origin so the place of origin and also the process of uh, production the king of king is what we call aceto balsamico tradizionale and tradizionale being the key word Mm -hmm. uh, so while the the um, the makers cannot patent you know aceto and balsamico they can trademark the three words together so aceto balsamico tradizionale is trademarked and it can be used only if you make aceto balsamico in the traditional way which is you take grape must which is the first cooking of the wine and then you change it through a series of ascetic fermentation and in then age it for several years by letting it reduce in barrels of decreasing size uh, exposed to the element and the changing weather patterns which is why it's in attics and not in cellars and eventually you start with this much and you end up with this much <laughs> then there is an outside um an outside entity that has to come in and says, yes, this is the real balsamic vinegar. And you can actually seal it with the imprint of the consortia and it gets the EU brand. The bottles are numbered. It can only go in a specific bottle and it can only come from either Modena or Reggio Emilia. Mm -hmm. The other type of balsamic vinegar, uh, which is the PGI, the Protected um, Geographical Indication, is a kind of like um kind of like a, a simpler a simpler relative of the traditional and what we look for here is the origin so it has to say aceto balsamico di modena egp or pgi and that is made with some um some grape must which can be either fresh or concentrated but then it also has uh, a percentage of red wine vinegar and it has a percentage you can even have a little percentage of sugar to um, help with color and and fermentation it's ready after the first month of life and then it can be aged as much as three years to be called invecchiato so this is a good product it's a product with which you can cook with which you can make a salad dressing there are, because, because the production uh, criteria are much more lax, obviously there are very, many different qualities of it. Um, whereas when you're talking about traditionale, there's only extraordinary and unbeatable, mm -hmm. right? Obviously the price is different. The use is different with aceto balsamico traditionale. This is not something that you want to cook. It's something that you just like put on top. Mm -hmm. uh, you put on your gelato, you put it on your fruit, you put it in a cocktail. I absolutely love it in a cocktail. So it's not a cooking as much as it's kind of like a sensation, a pleasure. Balsamic vinegar can have a massive range in price. Yeah. I mean, of course, if you're aging something for 12 years, you would expect it to cost more money. Yeah. But uh, like, how do you make those determinations for yourself about when to spend like the $300 on the bottle of olive oil or not? So if you are going to have a aceto balsamico tradizionale you need to be ready to spend like at least probably like at least 70 80 dollars for 100 milliliters right 
Mm-hmm. And this is something that lasts for a long time because you, you don't douse aceto balsamico tradizionale because a few drops of it carry so much punch that you really don't want to douse. You don't need to. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't even like it, truth be told. Now, when it comes to the PGI, um, yes, I mean, the situation is that, that because, as I said, the, the criteria are much wider. Price is a bit of a determinant of what you're getting because, obviously, if you're putting more red wine vinegar and less um, less vinegar that has aged for several years, then you're going to get a much cheaper product, mm-hmm. right? So you can get an aceto balsamico di Modena that's like six seven dollars, and one that's maybe like thirty or forty dollars. Mm-hmm. The thirty or forty dollars one will be a better one. Will have a a better you know much more. Um, curated life and production so again it's up to you but it is controlled to in in that there is a certain uh, protocol of production that everybody has to abide by if it doesn't say i mean the thing that is important to understand is if it doesn't say tradizionale or if it doesn't uh, identify the provenance as either modena or reggio emilia you are not getting a real product you are getting a product that is controlled by no one Mm -hmm. there is no entity that will go in and say this is the real thing and this is done right so when it comes to aceto balsamico those are the two products that you want to look at and obviously what i call the king of king uh, or maybe maybe you know the royal of royals i don't want to gender (laughs) balsamic is it's a choice it's something that you really you want to have you want to invest the money just think of it though it's something that you really need very little of so i always have balsamico tradizionale in my kitchen and i buy it maybe once or twice a year yeah i'm curious from your point of view having all this background knowledge growing up in the place that you did with the parents that you had yeah. what is it like for you to be in an in a italian quote unquote aisle at an american grocery store you know that's funny that's not you know i um have to say that i have the good luck of being able to afford a really good food so um my grocery stores you know i don't i don't go to large chain grocery stores because i'm lucky enough not to have to um but i always but i also think that if you go to uh, to even a large chain grocery store you are bound to find some good Italian ingredients. And that's because one of the things that Italians are good at is taking tradition and the quality of tradition and making and building a a large-scale production that respects the tradition as much as possible. So the Parmigiano, for example, it might be some that is incredible and some that it's just very good, but it's always going to be very good. Now, if you're talking of the dry food aisle, so if you're talking about things, you know, like canned ravioli and things like that, I don't really consider that food. So mm-hmm. <laughs> it just doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't, you know, but you can find amazing, like a lot of really good pasta in the States and not only pasta imported from Italy, but now we have, nowadays we have like really great domestic production of pasta. So yeah. Um, you know, I look for that. I look for things that I know are going to be good. Every place is going to have like a couple of different olive oil selections, uh, peeled tomatoes. Obviously, I'm not going to go to the large chain grocery store to look for botarga, right? Or mm-hmm. for or for like tiny caper buds, right? But mm-hmm. I am going there. I know that I will find at least some of the things that I need and that they will be good. You write about your mother's pesto the last oh, yeah. the last memory of your mother's pesto and i wonder yeah. if you'd be willing to share that story i do would you like me to read it or just tell you uh either one up to you if you have it feel free well to read the it. story uh, my mother made a pesto that was not not usual not the way that we talk about pesto genovese but it's it should be noted that in italian the word pesto just means something that is pestled right so you can really make pesto with anything it just so happens that the most famous is the pesto genovese uh, but so my mother's pesto had, of course, lots of basil, but it also had like a bunch of herbs that she grew in her um, in her uh, terrace. Um, among them, for example, marjoram, which to this day is like my favorite herb by far. Hmm. Um, she would use pine nuts if she had them, but then if she didn't, she might put in some almonds and maybe walnuts. And if she had some parsley, she would also put it in and somehow just 
make it all happen. Mm-hmm. And her pesto was exceptional. It was hardly ever the same twice, but it had like a, just like this background sensorial loving experience that made it indelib- indelibly my mother's pesto. So my mother died pretty young. She was uh, 74. And um, we kept her house for a few years because I don't think any of us was ready to give it up. And we were going through her things once. It was all of us, I think all five of us at her place. She had been gone at that point for, for a few months already. And we were hungry. You know, we hadn't even touched the pantry or anything. So we kind of like started looking around and sure enough in the freezer, there are some jars of pesto because she would like Mm -hmm. make jars that uh, were of different size, depending on how many people she planned to feed with them. So she had like the little baby food jars if it was only two people and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So we find a jar of pesto and it just kind of all of a sudden it all came together. So one of us was setting the table. The other one was like, you know, warming the pesto and then there was the pasta going And then we all kind of sat down, all five of us, to these things. And it was as if she was still there. There was her unusualness and her being, you know, being a person that just like her pesto was always unexpected, but (laughs) Hmm. delicious nonetheless. Oh, that's lovely. I mean, yeah, we've talked about that in, in a relatively recent show. We talked about how the quality of somebody's recorded voice can like really bring that person back to you. And that that's when someone passes away, that's one thing that you lose the sound of is their yes. uh, voice, yeah. unless you've already had it recorded. And I, I kind of love the idea of, you know, here's this pesto that she created and, and also your decision to eat it. Cause uh, other people could decide like, Oh, I just have to keep this for some solemn occasion. Yeah. And instead you just all dove right in. Yes. My, my, as I said, my mother always, one of the things that she did best was gather people around their food because she was a really very good cook. So, yeah. you know, it was just, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> that was the best way to honor her. Well, and at the very, very end of the book, I think probably even in your acknowledgments, um, you refer to yourself as a wanderer, which is something we talk about a lot. But why would you say that that's a part of your self-definition? Um, I mean, because it's been in a in a number of, I've been in, I've lived in a number of places. So I've lived, of course, in Italy um, and in uh, New York and in San Francisco. But I also lived in Hawaii for a couple of years. When I lived in Italy, we all, I also always had kind of like two different homes, right? So there was the home in Perugia, but then we also spent the summers on the coast, uh, which is actually where my mother is buried. So I considered that also part of my wandering. And, but I also love Milano, so I have a dear aunt in Milano, and I always spend a lot of time there, and I really feel at home. My mother-in-law is a small house in London, and when I go to London, I also feel very at home. Hmm. Um, but, you know, the and food for me is is a way of uh, tying me, right? So I think of this this pantry that I, these characters that I have put in this story that I'm telling as kind of like my my grounding, my heart. But then wherever I am, I go out and I discover the other things that are good and then I can cross with my heart and that's how I make it a home, right? It's Hmm. it's to have a house, but a home is a little difficult. And this is what, you know, my husband always says of me is that uh, he calls it my way of shaping the situation. So that even if we're staying in a hotel for three nights, I have a way of making it feel like that's like our little corner that the world cannot come into. That's (laughs) a very good skill. (laughs) That's a very good skill to have. (laughs) Thank you. Well, the book is called Italy by Ingredient. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you, Katie. It was a pleasure. And thank you for liking the book. I yeah. did very much. And I've actually marked, as you can see here I, with my post-it notes, I have uh, some <laughs> of my earliest recipes that I'm going to try first already marked. Thank you. Yeah. And of course, if you want to learn more, we have a link to your website in the show notes also to your social media. You can see pictures on our social media too, Bittersweet Life Podcast. Just look for us on all the big socials and uh, we'll see you there. And thanks again. Thank you. And until next time, this is The Bittersweet Life. I'm Katie Sewell. Talk to you soon. Bye.